Hello, my name is Cormac McCarthy, and I'm a pulmonologist working in Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, specializing in rare and genetic lung disease. Today I will outline a case which highlights an approach to differentiating common from uncommon causes of airflow obstruction. I will briefly describe some of the pathogenesis and management of these conditions, but our main focus will be how to recognize these rare lung diseases. So we will begin with a case history. A 70-year-old woman presented to the pulmonary clinic. She had a five-year history of increasing dyspnea on exertion associated with a cough, which was occasionally productive. She had an episode of pneumonia at age 30 and experienced recurrent episodes of bronchitis ever since then. She had no nocturnal, atopic, or asthma-like symptoms. She was a never smoker and she had a history of mild gastroesophageal reflux. Her examination was unremarkable, apart from minimally reduced air entry in the bases, and her chest x-ray was essentially normal. Subsequently, she underwent complete pulmonary function testing. Her spirometry pre-bronchodilator demonstrated an obstructive pattern with a moderately reduced FEV1 at 57% predicted. Following bronchodilation, there was no significant improvement in her FEV1, and her diffusion capacity was moderately reduced at 60% predicted. To summarize so far, this 70-year-old female presented with dyspnea, cough, and had an obstructive airflow pattern without reversibility. Notably, she was never a smoker and had no occupational exposure. She had no features of asthma. What other causes of airflow obstruction should we consider at this point? At this stage, we should consider a differential diagnosis for less commonly considered causes of airflow obstruction. These would include chronic severe asthma, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, excessive dynamic airway collapse, tracheobronchomalacia, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, bronchiolitis obliterans, and diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, or DIPNIC. What about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in this case? Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a genetic cause of emphysema that is often missed due to the perception that it is very rare. While it meets the definition of a rare disease, it is more common than often appreciated. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is a serine protease, and a deficiency in this leads to unopposed proteolytic damage to the lung, resulting primarily in emphysema. So who should be tested? The ATS-ERS recommend testing for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in the following. All patients with COPD or emphysema. Non-responsive asthmatic adults or adolescents. All cases of cryptogenic cirrhosis or liver disease. Cases of granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Bronchiectasis of unknown etiology. Paniculitis or any first degree relative of a patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. How do we diagnose alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? We do so by using blood testing. Two tests are performed. Firstly, the level of alpha-1 antitrypsin is measured. And if this is below one gram per liter, then further analysis of the phenotype should be checked. Through isoelectric focusing, we can identify the type of alpha-1 antitrypsin protein present in the blood. If there is a disparity between alpha-1 antitrypsin levels and the phenotype, or in the case of a rare isoelectric focusing pattern, then genetic analysis may be required to determine the deficiency state of the individual. Depending on the phenotype and level of alpha-1 antitrypsin, there is a correlation with increased risk of lung disease. The most severe form of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is the ZZ phenotype, and this presents as emphysema as early as in the third decade of life. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a systemic disorder with numerous manifestations. The most common manifestation is early onset emphysema, which is panacinar in nature, and there's a disproportionate involvement of the lung bases. Liver disease occurs in approximately 10% of ZZ alpha-1 patients, and this happens as a result of misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin accumulating in the liver and causing hepatitis and cirrhosis. A rare manifestation of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is necrotizing paniculitis, which is a painful inflammation of the subcutaneous tissue that can present rapidly and cause significant morbidity. In patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the predominant CT findings are of emphysema, seen here throughout the lungs. However, the hallmark feature in alpha-1 is of lower lobe predominant emphysema and is indicated by the arrows as shown. It is important to recognize alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency as patients with the ZZ phenotype may benefit from replacement therapy. This entails plasma purified alpha-1 antitrypsin replacement, which has been shown to slow the loss of lung tissue in these individuals. Shifting our focus slightly in terms of other common differentials, what about causes of airway collapse? Excessive dynamic airway collapse is the pathological collapse and narrowing of airway lumen by more than 50%. This is entirely due to the laxity of the posterior wall membrane, 
with structurally intact airway cartilage. This occurs in about a fifth of COPD and asthma patients, but can occur as its own entity. Separately, tracheobronchomalacia is a weakness of the anterior and or lateral walls of the main airways. This is caused by a softening of the cartilage and can be a primary or can occur as a result of numerous lung diseases. Both of these entities were traditionally diagnosed by bronchoscopy. However, dynamic CT thorax can be diagnostic and can determine the degree, extension and nature of the narrowing. Interventions for excessive dynamic airway collapse can be non-invasive ventilation. And for excessive dynamic airway collapse and tracheobronchomalacia, stents have been used depending on the underlying etiology. Returning to our case, her alpha-1 level and phenotype were both normal. She underwent a dynamic and high-resolution CT thorax, and there was no evidence of airway collapse on the dynamic CT. Findings on her high-resolution CT were consistent with a mosaic perfusion pattern and air trapping, highlighted here by the arrows shown. There was also bronchial wall thickening present. At this stage, a differential for air trapping may include hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is also referred to as extrinsic allergic alveolitis. This is a complex syndrome of varying presentation and severity, and not a single disease. Numerous inciting agents can induce this reaction, and while it is typically associated with a restrictive pattern on spirometry, it can have an obstructive picture due to small airway narrowing. In the context of air trapping with bronchial wall thickening, one would consider bronchiolitis obliterans, also known as obliterative bronchiolitis. Similarly, this is a clinical syndrome associated with injury to small airways caused by a myriad of infectious, inhalational and toxic exposures. It is rare and often irreversible and may require lung transplantation. Returning to our case, on closer inspection, there was evidence of numerous pulmonary nodules on her CT thorax, some of which are highlighted here by the arrows shown. To summarize the CT findings in our case, there was mosaic perfusion with air trapping, Numerous subcentimeter nodules were also present. All of these findings were in a non-smoker with fixed airflow obstruction. Together, these findings point us towards a diagnosis of diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, or DIPNIC for short, which is what this patient was diagnosed with. Diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia is a very rare disease, which predominantly occurs in women aged 45 to 70 years old. The symptoms are usually chronic cough and dyspnea, and these are often ongoing for years prior to diagnosis. Patients have a fixed airflow obstruction on spirometry and often have a reduced diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. There are distinctive CT findings associated with dyspnea. These distinctive CT findings are the presence of pulmonary nodules on a background of mosaic attenuation. Mosaic attenuation is often the predominant finding, with air trapping evident on the expiratory phase of high-resolution CT thorax. This can occasionally be significant enough to see on the inspiratory phase of a CT. The majority of patients also have evidence of bronchial wall thickening, and regarding the nodules in dyspnea, they are usually non-calcified, well-defined, round, and usually measure between 6 and 10 millimetres. The nodules are distributed diffusely and are more prominent in the lower lobes, and patients usually have more than 20 nodules present. So to briefly describe the pathogenesis of dyspnea, pulmonary neuroendocrine cells are distributed throughout the respiratory tract. While increased numbers of these cells can be found in other diseases, hyperplasia of these cells as the primary finding is rare in other conditions and is specifically associated with dyspnea. These are neuroendocrine cells and may contain calcitonin, crogramin, gastrin-releasing peptide or serotonin. It is believed that the obstructive lung disease occurs as a result of the secretion of these neuropeptides, leading to tissue remodeling in the small airways. The diagnosis of dyspnea can often be made based on a high clinical suspicion with consistent radiological features. A biopsy for pathological confirmation is not always necessary, and it is debated what the best approach for biopsy is in this heterogeneously distributed condition. The use of serum chromogramin A levels can be helpful both in diagnosis and in measuring a treatment response in this condition. What are the treatment options of dyspnea? Somatostatin analogues have been prescribed in dyspnea and have been shown to improve the debilitating cough the patients report. These drugs have also been shown to reduce serum levels of crogramin A. There are potential future treatment options for dyspnea, including possibly mTOR inhibitors, as it has been shown that the mTOR pathway is activated in dyspnea, and trials of these drugs in bronchial carcinoid have demonstrated some benefit.
To summarise the importance of making the correct diagnosis and not simply dismissing all airflow obstruction as COPD or asthma, it is important to identify entities such as excessive dynamic airway collapse, which are treatable. Also, it is vital to identify rapidly progressive conditions, such as bronchiolitis obliterans, where early intervention may be life-saving. Making the correct diagnosis and not missing rare diseases may allow appropriate treatment, such as augmentation therapy in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and somatostatin analogues in DIPNIC. The take-home points from this section on uncommon causes of airflow obstruction are, firstly, all patients with COPD should be tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Also, any patient with airflow obstruction that is atypical or difficult to classify should also be tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Referral to a specialty clinic should occur for these patients to ensure appropriate management of their alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Bronchiolitis obliterans should be referred in a timely manner to a specialty clinic to ensure adequate and safe management. And finally, DIPNIC is an extremely rare and relatively newly described entity and should be referred to a rare lung disease clinic for appropriate follow-up.